Hello, my name is Rochelle Innocent and I'm the founder and CEO of Project Purpose. Welcome to our channel. Our community is focused on fostering the intellectual and character development in children. We do this through our parent-child workshops that are focused on four themes autonomy, self-efficacy, compassion, and self-concept in order to cultivate grit, perseverance, and resilience in each child. At Project Purpose, our overarching mandate is to renew and rebuild family, community, and relationships. Our different social media platforms provide us with an opportunity to have discussions on all topics that relate to family, community, and relationships with ourselves as well as with others with a primary focus on mental health and education. More precisely, the ways that the institutions of mental health and education play a role and have played a role in our societies at large. These discussions and debates provide us with an opportunity to think critically about what needs to change within these structures in order for us to live up to our bold slogan, support, protect, and empower each child through youth-focused development, better known as leadership in juvenescence. We recognize that in valuing our children's leadership potential, this also translates as recreating and co-creating environments, both socially and politically, that will enable our children to thrive. For those of you who are particularly keen on the topic, we do write thought pieces every other Sunday. We just dropped a thought piece this past Sunday, so definitely be sure to go over to the website once you're done with this segment and check it out. If it is the case that you're up and about and on the go, take us along the ride with you. We are now available on nine different podcast platforms, pretty much any podcast platform made available. We've provided the links for you in the description down below. Now, as is the convention, definitely be sure to subscribe. Hit that post notification bell so that you are aware of every time we post. And of course, if you like these conversations and you want to keep them going, like, comment, and share this segment. Let's get into it. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to another segment here on Project Purpose. For those of you who are new, we cover topics that relate to mental health, mental wellness, and education on a week-by-week -week basis, and this week our topics of discussion are going to be focused around education. Now before jumping into today's segment, a few housekeeping items, I wanted to let you know that our first live event is scheduled to take place. Definitely be sure to check out our Facebook page, I've provided the link popping up somewhere here on the screen. And Definitely check us out on all of our social media platforms so that you are always in the know as to when our live events are taking place. These are paid live events. And if it is the case that you want to participate in our live events on an ongoing basis, we do have membership plans for you. So you can be sure to check out our membership plans on our website. I've provided a quick snapshot right here where my hand is. These live events are meant to be very fun, very engaging, very thought provoking, giving us an opportunity to dig deep into the values we hold, into the beliefs we hold, and if we're whether or not the values and beliefs are limiting and what we can do to change that so that we can live our lives to the fullest with our eyes wide open as it relates to all of the areas where we may want to put our energy that will contribute in us living fulfilled lives. So definitely wanted to put a plug in for the live event there. Um, the link will be available in the description down below. So the first live event will be our focus on joy and we're going to be defining and discussing joy conceptually. And our next segment will be digging deep into how to create and maintain joy in our lives respectively. So definitely wanted to take a moment to give you the heads up on that. Um, if it is the case that you're not going to be available for the live events in September, they are ongoing. We will be having at minimum two live events every single month and the theme of the month will be different. If you are curious as to the themes, they are available on our website. The link is going to pop up somewhere here on the screen and I definitely just wanted to give you a heads up about that. So thank you so much for listening to that. Let's jump into today's segment. We're going to be talking about the importance of intentionally cultivating character development. And I think this is really very important and it is a core tenet of Project Purpose and the driving philosophy behind the parent-child workshops that we offer. And it is one of the qualities that we are building and cultivating very intentionally in our parent-child workshops. But a lot of people ask me, what is character development anyway? And how do we formalize something as abstract as character? And it's an interesting question. It's something that I think often we take for granted. We kind of 
assume that character development is nitty gritty, like doing, you know, those those chores uh, at home growing up. Maybe that was something that we thought was character development or maybe going fruit picking so that you get a sense of, you know, the value of a dollar. I'm not sure if, if that was part of your upbringing, but definitely part of mine. Uh, the first real lesson around, you know, valuing the dollar was definitely going fruit picking all day in the heat and then realizing, you know, how much a little basket of blueberries actually ended up costing. Hard labor, definitely my first example. But I think that jokes aside, character development can be and, and should be more thorough than that, more comprehensive than that. And it's something that we need to think about as touching on even the smallest aspects of our lived experience. And this is important because when we live in a collective society that is focused or, you know, at least markets itself as focused on the liberties and freedoms of all within it, then the only way that we can hope to uphold liberties and freedoms of all is if we all have had that degree of character development to uphold those values, right? So when we have these different values that we speak about, that we take pride in, it's important that for those values to translate in action, we do the proper development to be able to uphold those values moving forward. And when we have a society, a collective that is based on true cooperation, that cooperation in and of itself is going to articulate itself through the core aspects that are built into our own characters. So so when we think about liberties and freedoms as individuals, I mean, we can think of liberties and freedoms as things that take place um, physically, but liberties and freedoms are also psychological, they're mental, and they're also emotional. So when you have a collective working together to uphold and ensure the continuation of liberties and freedoms, it takes a certain character to uphold that and we can't assume that that character is upheld based on platitudes that we tell ourselves about you know and and a lot of what we say about our free countries Um, a lot of them are platitudes but you know they're platitudes that we believe in we build values around them but we just want to make sure that those values in and of themselves are founded on you know the appropriate character in and of itself so i think this is an important topic to unearth and i want to give you my perspective it's a bit of a philosophical perspective on the issue more social political philosophical perspective on the issue but i think it's important for us all to kind of take a step back and think about why character development is important and why it's something that we should think about very intentionally by way of how we focus on developing our own characters how we fill in the gaps in our own character development based on just societal norms that kind of poke holes into our character development, how we think about arrested development and what that even means and what that looks like. And a lot of us millennials, arrested development was a really popular show when we were growing up. But hopefully when I provide some purview as to what it is that I'm talking about, we can see how satirical it actually is as, as a show. And, and and we think about the ways that society as it is stands to hinder character development for, for a variety of different reasons, for a variety of different social groups that play into our collective. So for the purpose of this argument, we're going to talk about character development in relation to the common good. And character development is always in relation to whatever it is that our society upholds as its values. And for a free and and liberal country, our values are based on supporting and enforcing those freedoms and those liberties. So it's important that all of us have a general sense of common good and of upholding that common good and have a shared definition of what common good means. So for this argument, we're going to define common good as the attitudes and opinions that we that we uphold in relation to the interests of different social groups within society. And so we have sort of the platitude that we tell ourselves about common good and what our working definition of common good is and and how we say we feel about the opinions and interests of other members within our society and how the dissonance between those two or the disparity between those two ideals, so the spoken ideal and the buried ideal, how that serves to either hinder or support our character character development because it takes character to work as a collective towards the common 
good. I mean, character in and of itself can develop accidentally. It can develop through these platitudes that we tell ourselves. We raise our children on these ideals that we ourselves are raised on, the ideals that are romanticized and that are largely broken in practice, but they're ideals that we we don't actually see the problem in the ideals or, or we don't actually see the way that these ideals fail to deliver on themselves in our societies until we're much older. And it can be very disheartening of an experience to recognize that when we say true, strong, and free, I mean, that's relative, right? No one really thinks of these terms as relative, but when we think about the way that society in and of itself is sort of structured and how it translates, then, then we recognize how that relativity translates and even that relativity in and of itself, how that feeds into or hinders our own personal character development depending on where we stand and how our stance translates in action. So yeah, so on the one hand, it can be accidental. On the other hand, it can be grounded in deliberate conversations and intention around how we cultivate someone's character in order to uphold the common good moving forward, making sure that we give a baseline of the current landscape. So we talk about the current social political landscape. We talk about the differences in opinions that exist within this current landscape. We talk about the history that informs this current landscape and, and like the full broad scope of history. I, I think I've mentioned in a few videos, there's there's many perspectives to history. And I think for someone to develop their own position and kind of cultivate their own inner working of what that history is and how it translates, it's important to have multiple perspectives feed into it. And it's important also that with that well, multifaceted history, you provide multiple points of view around the current social political landscape in and of itself, offering also your point of view and how your actions translate in relation to the point of view that you carry about common good as it relates to the current social and political landscape. So why is this important? Um, it's important because our attitude towards the common good, so our attitudes towards the opinions and interests of others should translate in action. So we should be able to call ourselves out if we have an ideal or an attitude about our role as citizens in upholding and ensuring the common good. And that ideal or that idea fails to translate in action in and of itself. And so if there is a case, there's a misalignment, you have an ideal, there's there's things that you say about your beliefs around the common good, which is the way that you ensure that the opinions and interests of everyone within our shared collective are upheld and the actions that you've taken to ensure that the way that we would position ourselves against that misalignment is align ourselves closer to our actions. So our actions are a stronger communicator of our actual stance as it relates to the common good, as opposed to the words that we say, which in a lot of the case are platitudes that we have heard that we repeat and regurgitate without really reflecting and thinking about what it means to actually live by and stand by some of the platitudes that we like to kind of mention in conversation at a cocktail party here or there. So anyways, so attitudes regarding common good should align with your action and if there's a misalignment between your attitudes and the actions that you have in relation to the common good then you need to align yourself with your action your action is actually the depiction of how you really feel about the common good in and of itself or better yet i said action in action uh, it's a more accurate representation it's a more accurate representation of your actual working definition of what the common good means to you of your role in ensuring the common good. Why is all of this important? Is because this feeds into character development. Character development is always in relation to societal values and societal values in a free and liberal country. It translates around the common good of all opinions and interests within that collective identity. And the way that we uphold that is through our character and our character needs to be developed in accordance to the value or in relation to that value in and of itself. So this is important because of the effects. So the effects of us not doing the intentional work of cultivating character that will uphold and that will allow those values to translate in action or not cultivating character or developing character in alignment with the values that we have in place. And this is important because though we say that the common good means we, we care for the opinions and interests of everyone within our collective society equally, when we look at the actual landscape, we know that that isn't true because we live in a reality, and this is regardless of where you are. I myself, you know, I'm Canadian, but a lot of the societies that are, you know, even 
have the luxury of being able to watch this YouTube video or small reflections of one another, then you can see aspects of this in your society as well. But the actual working definition of common good in the majority of societies is that the common good actually translates as some benefiting from society more than others. And, and what do I mean when I say that? When you live in a society where some people's interests carry more weight than other people's interests. If it is the case that the laws and the customs of a certain country honor and respect the well-being of some over others, if it is the case that your collective society, though it, you know, praises itself as, you know, seeking the, you know, the common good by way of, you know, equality amongst its members, if, if some of those members within that society, based on the laws and customs of that society, we recognize that their honor and their well-being are, are treated as less worthy than other members of society, if their protection and promotion are considered as less worthy than other members of society, if there are institutions and practices that mostly benefit some members over other members in society, if all of these practices and customs and traditions are present, then we are in actuality living in a society where the social engagements in and of themselves across the board, so across the map, make it so that opportunity isn't offered equally across all members of society, therefore distorting the definition of common good. So the common good definition now is relative and is conditional. That's important, but why does that translate to character development? Again, we remember character development is important because character development is required in order to uphold the values and beliefs of a specific country. So if your country is built on a certain cultural fabric to ensure that that cultural fabric remains intact. You need to raise and develop children to have a character to uphold and enforce those values for generations to come. It does not happen accidentally. So if it is the case that the social conditions in actuality are unconducive to the values, the spoken values, which now I guess are more platitudes that are spoken to, it's going to feed into character development. It's unconducive to the development of one's moral and intellectual aptitudes in relation to the activities that are required to enforce a collective society where the common good of all opinions and interests are valued, which means what? It creates arrested development, right? So what happens when we observe in our society these traditions and these customs and these norms that show that there are certain groups that are held in higher esteem than other groups, then that's going to arrest our moral and intellectual development. We're going to develop our characters around those norms while still speaking to ideals that are now platitudes that we no longer longer hold ourselves accountable to to build a bridge between by way of our action and that value in and of itself. They're kind of spoken values, but we recognize that it doesn't actually translate in action because everyone seems okay with the fact that it doesn't translate in action. We're okay with the fact that it doesn't translate in action. And, and if we're okay by the fact that it doesn't translate in action, we need to recognize that that is actually eroding at our moral and intellectual development in and of itself. It distorts our moral and intellectual development towards this norm, to, towards recognizing that when we say common good, we actually mean the common good of some over others or some at the, you know, at the expense of others. And, and that working definition works for us because it is the working definition that drives our collective societies. So we see this all throughout, you know, present, past, and, and most likely future if we don't kind of do the work to focalize on, on character development, to close the gap between actions and traditions and customs within our society and, and the articulated values within that given society, then, you know, you have two situations here that, that create issues within our society. On the one hand, you have people who recognize that they're benefiting from current practices, so from the current norms. So that means that without intention, they're born and bred with an inner sense of superiority. And this is just for the fact that they're enjoying by birth different privileges privileges, institutional privileges from which others are excluded. What it creates is it creates a, a need, emotional, mental, psychological need to see the people beneath them so that they recognize or beneath them because these individuals don't have the same institutional privileges. They want to see them supplicate and suffer because it reinforces their sense of superiority. So, so having the sense of superiority, needing to feed the sense of superiority, the way it, it is fed is through the supplication
compassion and suffering of those who are who are in advertently beneath them based on the distribution of these institutional privileges within that society. So they have it confirmed. In fact, they need to have it confirmed by drawing out behaviors, uh, the behaviors of their inferiors or institutional inferiors. And under the pressure of this need, they cultivate dependencies and it makes them very self-involved and unfree, right? So when you have a society that congratulates itself or that, you know, prides itself on being free. We need to think about freedom more deeply. So freedom isn't just physical freedom. You think about psychological, emotional freedom as well. And, and when you have people who are born and bred to have this sense of superiority, who need to enforce and reinforce that sense of superiority through, through, through the suffering and supplication of the inferiors, then that creates an issue in society in and of itself. And that creates a distortion that now creates a block because your character is cultivated on this foundation of superiority that you need to reinforce and validate through the subjugation of those who are inferior to you. So are you really free? And the answer to that question is no. On, on the other hand of that equation, when people come to see themselves as inferior based on the institutional privileges that they're excluded from within society, then they can easily fall into states of humility and subservience. So they adapt behaviors and personalities that kind of coincide with this inferiority complex. And it makes them easy prey. So easy pickings for those who, who need someone to target in order to feed into their sense of superiority. So everyone sort of breaks apart based on the institutional privileges that they allow and start feeding into these maladaptive relations with one another in order to feed into a sense of inferiority or feed into a sense of superiority, creating a very vicious cycle. So the people who kind of take on this inferiority complex, they're, they're very easily preyed on by those who have a superiority complex and they're, they're very easy to manipulate and control because they've taken on this posture of humility and subservience. Or as an alternative, if it is the case that those who lack the institutional privileges retain their own sense of self-worth and recognize that they're not regarded equally based on these institutional privileges that they have not had access to, then it can create a lot of misplaced anger and rage. And because it would be imprudent to go directly to the horse's mouth, so directly to the individuals who are the ones kind of upholding these systems of oppression that are creating contention across social groups within this collective society that is focalized on the common good, but that common good is distorted based on the customs and practices, then that misplaced anger and rage is taken out on, on local objects in destructive or even self-destructive ways. So this is an example that all of us have experienced. All of us have experienced this to varying degrees. Everyone within a society in some ways or in other ways have a, carry a superiority complex or carry an inferiority complex. Everyone within our society to varying degrees benefit from institutional privileges and recognize their exclusion from other institutional privileges. The, the important thing to recognize is that if we want to break away from this cycle of recognizing and creating uh, a sense of value based on what is common practice opposed to based on what values are supposed to uphold that society, then and we're going to be in this constant cycle of destruction. We can't find our way back to common ground, which is this common good based on the equal valuation of the opinions and interests of everyone who takes part in that group. And this is commonly recognized in all caste societies. And capitalistic societies are caste societies. I mean, there are different versions of caste societies all across the world, but caste societies create a lot of division within those societies just based on the complexes that are a byproduct of people recognizing that they carry institutional priv privilege and those recognizing that they're excluded from institutional privilege and how that plays into the psychology of those individuals moving forward. And the issue with this is because of the preoccupation with a sense of inferiority or a sense of superiority, this preoccupation renders us unfree, right? So when we think about freedom as a psychological state, if you think about freedom as a psychological, emotional, mental state, not just physical freedom, then people who are preoccupied with proving 
or having validified their superiority or their inferiority based on the interactions that they have with one another, they're not really free to kind of, you know, participate in society as a free citizen because they're mentally imprisoned, essentially, which is a rabbit hole. It's a very deep rabbit hole that we can go down. I'm going to provide the link to the different social political schools of thought around this idea. But I think that it's important that we recognize that Character development is important if it is the case that we would like to create at least a climate for change where these institutions can be adjusted and modified to be more inclusive of everyone as it relates to institutional privilege, because institutional privilege is something that we can focalize on. It's something very tangible. You know, we can figure out a way to erode this caste system that's in place based on the types of societies that are currently governed. But we need to decide where we where we stand. And a lot of the times, if we're okay with our inferiority complex or with our superiority complex, if we're okay with the validation that we feel when we see people supplicate and suffer, and that feeds into our sense of superiority, then we need to recognize that as arrested development and as a character flaw, right? That is aspects of our character that were developed in accordance with present day society and not in accordance with what, you know, a character would need to look like to enforce a truly free and liberal society. So why Project Purpose is to focus on character development is because we recognize that in order to maintain any hope of establishing a country that is truly free, where people aren't preoccupied about their sense of superiority or inferiority in relation to one another, we need to put the focus back on cultivating characters in individuals who will in action navigate environments and relationships in a way that encourages and that promotes and that will shift and change the tide around institutional privilege within that society so that it is truly evenly distributed. And I don't think this can happen overnight because this is a byproduct of our characters, or of the characters who are behind the scenes, who are upholding the institutions, the customs, the norms that maintain the disparity in institutional privilege. But if you want to close that gap, we focus on character. We don't close that gap by focusing on policy because those who create policy are those whose characters are developed based on the settings that they came from, right? And, and all of us, we were kind of developed with these different platitudes, but over time we recognize where we actually stood. And sometimes we don't even know where we actually stand. We don't really take the time to dissect our actions, but when we, so we continue to allow ourselves to kind of speak in platitudes, but our actions show that we're comfortable upholding different norms and traditions and practices that maintain the disparity and in institutional privilege, that maintain the division and the tension between different social groups within that society that is supposedly all driven towards this collective common good, which is the equal valuation of the interests and opinions of others. So this was largely philosophical and I wanted it to be philosophical because I think the concept of character development, why it's important, it's a philosophical reason as to why it's important. If it is the case that we want to change a social and political climate in order to allow everyone to thrive, we need to focus on character first. And sometimes we think, oh, we need to focus on policy, but you know, policies are a reflection of the characters that put their time uh, and their blood, sweat and tears into those policies. And if we look at ourselves and we really see where we are on that spectrum, like how it is that we benefit from the institutional privilege and how it is that we speak to whether or not we're comfortable with institutional privilege and whether or not our values and our beliefs translate in action. I mean, that's the truth we all need to really kind of come to terms with with ourselves. And if it is a case that there is a misalignment, then hopefully we feel inclined to bridge that misalignment through our actions and through intentionally working on our own characters and our own sense of self so that we're not people who are comfortable speaking in platitudes, we're comfortable sitting and watching institutional privilege being unevenly distributed. So um, I guess the reason why Project Purpose values this is because we recognize that if it is the case that we would like to see a future where common good in practice aligns with common good in sort of philosophy is that we need to focus on the character development of people within those societies to ensure that all of us are driven and motivated to maintain a, a common good that values the interests and opinions of every member within that society, which works again towards eroding any formal informal caste system within that specific society. So 
That's sort of the premise there. And I think that that's the argument for why it's important that as parents, as educators, as anyone who plays a role in cultivating, developing, and nourishing the minds of young children, it's important that we recognize the importance of character and why character is the focal point of any hope of us maintaining and enforcing a society as it is today or allowing your society to grow and develop to be more aligned to the values that we uphold and that we communicate to others with pride. And that's regardless of where you are, whether you're in Canada, United States, Europe, it doesn't matter where you are. If it is the case that you see that there's this caste system and this caste system is creating division and tension and, you know, there's people with superiority complexes who are, you know, feeding into that by, you know, creating suffering and supplication in people who they consider to be inferior and those who are inferior either, you know, being subservient and you know practicing humility or angry and taking that anger out and other like these are issues within society that we can fix not easily but they're solvable if we really look at the root of the issue in and of itself and we tackle the issue at its root which is within each and every one of us right it's the attitudes and values and beliefs that we uphold and the way that we navigate in alignment with those attitudes and beliefs um, and hopefully our attitudes and beliefs are in alignment or we're working to have them become more aligned to the values that we kind of communicate as a society. So hopefully that answers the question as to why character development is a thing. I, I love talking about this. I'm trying to I'm trying to make it accessible because a lot of this is social and political philosophy and I want to provide you the links to the resources that I read that I will always read read continuously because with experience you kind of read the same passage with a very different perspective. But this is one of the driving philosophies behind Positive Purpose because we believe that if you focus on character development, then we're developing individuals who have the skills and the drive and the conviction to erode the institutional privileges that are unevenly distributed within our societies today, creating better societies for children to come tomorrow and in the future. So that's sort of the practical aspect of how we hope to have that translate in action. It's not just a platitude here. We actually have a, a plan in place to bring that to life. So when we say, you know, creating social and political environments for everyone to thrive, this is our way of approaching that. So I would love to hear your point of view on it. I'd love to hear your perspective by way of, you know, common good and how people sit on that spectrum and the misalignment between how we speak to common good and how it translates in action and the different roles that we take in society when institutional privilege is unevenly distributed and, and why this is very important to think about when we think about the growth and development of our children or the intellectual and character development of our children and we think about arrested development and in what ways we ourselves are suffering from arrested development and how we can counteract that in our own lives. In any case, that's this video on education. I hope it was informative. I hope it gave you food for thought. And I, I again, I'm going to give you different things to read to kind of, kind of reinforce the argument in and of itself. Um, but definitely feel free to do your own reading on it as well. But I think that, you know, there's work to be done and not very many people know where to start. And this is where I'm gonna start. You know, this is what we're hoping to accomplish with Project Purpose. And I'd love to hear your point of view. In any case, if you're still here, definitely be sure to subscribe, like, comment, share this segment with a parent, with an educator, with someone you know would appreciate or be interested in this topic. And we'll see you next time.